Uh, so yeah, I'm Natalie May. Uh, I'm a consultant in emergency medicine with paediatric emergency medicine working in Manchester. And I'm going to talk about something that's very specific to our workplace, about workplace-based assessments and how we can rethink those for teaching and for learning. Um, and there's three key things that I want you to know at the end of this talk, and that is that workplace-based assessments matter. That they give us insight into what happens in our departments and that the way that we approach them speaks volumes, not just about us as clinicians, but about our attitude towards teaching and education and towards our trainees. And in order to do that, we're going to be channeling the wisdom of this man, who is Robert Matthew Van Winkle. Now, I know you've never heard of him. Uh, he is the unsung hero of medical education. Uh, he's better known as Vanilla Ice. And you may be familiar with his 1990 self-reflective autobiographical opus, Ice Ice Baby, in which he instructs us as medical educators to stop, collaborate, <laughs> and listen. <laughs> and that's what we're going to do to make our workplace-based assessments better for our trainees. So first of all, I want to just stop, because when I say workplace-based assessment, I know that there are certain emotions that come out among you. Is that fair to say? So, in order to rethink that and get rid of those, I first of all want you to take a moment to speak to the person next to you and just say all the things that come into your head when someone says, I want to do a workplace-based assessment. Go for it. Share away. Okay, so that is about a minute. Um, and I'm judging from the volume of the speech that you have some quite strong feelings about this subject. Is that fair to say? Did anyone have anything positive to say about workplace-based assessments? Okay, we've got one person, that's brilliant. Okay, so it's just the rest of you I've got to convince. Okay, so there are problems with workplace-based assessments. We know that. They are imperfect in a variety of ways. They, there are loads of them. Uh, in my paediatric subspecialty year, I had 80 workplace-based assessments to complete in 12 months. They are a form-filling tick-box exercise. And we, as emergency clinicians, we don't like form-filling. We're all a little bit rebellious, and we quite like to just think outside the box and do things a bit differently. So having to uh, subscribe to a particular tick-box that we have to go through step-by-step, step, that really grinds against the way that we feel that we should be able to do our jobs. The trainees are stressed about them. They're used to people not engaging, so they just fire hundreds of requests into your inbox, and they have a very low expectation you're going to engage with them at all. They take ages. They're pretty dry, they're pretty dull. <coughs> but they're not a proper reflection of what, what's happening in our departments either when we fill them in just by filling in a form without seeing people. But actually, they feed into bigger problems in our emergency department. So I just want to share with you my one piece of paper. This is some genuine feedback from our F2s in our department. I think that this job is service provision rather than training. There is little to no teaching for trainees. I rarely receive feedback. It is not a particularly supportive working environment. I receive little feedback in four months about the quality of my case notes or patient management and how I can improve there. It's difficult to get SLEs completed during a busy time of the year. So our trainees have expectations about our departments that we're not meeting. This is a problem for us because it feeds into our bigger problems in emergency medicine, which is that we can't get people to stay in the specialty. We love what we do, but we're too busy doing it to be able to model it to the people who are going to do it in the future about what it is that's so great about emergency medicine. They're missing out on our passion because we haven't got time to spend face-to-face -face sharing it with them. And that's where these, things, these workplace assessments come in. This is a really good opportunity to work one-to-one with, one -one with trainees and show them what's great about emergency medicine. If we don't engage them in the higher thinking processes of emergency medicine, they're not going to understand the cognitive decisions that we make and the beauty of the nuance of clinical decision making that we're doing. They will start to see us like the rest of the hospital does as glorified triage machines, which we aren't. So it's really important that we put our preconceptions aside and we start to see workplace-based assessments as an opportunity to see the problems in our trainees where they exist and also to recognise and reward greatness among the people that we're working with. To model good behaviour and teamwork and communication skills and clinical judgement and to work alongside people and show them that passion for emergency medicine. Do you know what your juniors are doing in your department? If you're a consultant, do you sometimes find it difficult to sleep at night when you know that particular people are running the shift? Do you have trainees or non-training doctors who are consistently failing exams? And do you know why that is? Workplace-based assessments can help you to answer those questions. 
our learners, particularly from the F2 level, and if you're training new ANPs, I work quite closely with our trainee ANPs, they are cognitively overloaded, trying to learn the art of assimilating information from a patient, so a history and an examination, and to formulate a clinical plan. They want it to be simple, and it isn't simple. And if we don't get ourselves involved in that process, they will simplify it down until three months into their four-month job. They think that emergency medicine is easy and they have nothing left to learn. And that's when the danger comes. That's the Dunning-Kruger effect. Very quickly, you think you know everything and you don't. And then you come out the other side and you realise that you'll never, ever know anything ever about emergency medicine. It's terrifying and you spend the rest of your life trying to learn how to cope with that. Well, let's think slightly differently. When we first introduced simulation into our emergency department, what we saw was that in the simulation scenarios, people weren't doing the things that they would normally do. They were giving this bizarre behaviours, a bit like in OSCEs. Now, most people hate being in OSCEs. There are a small number of people who claim to love OSCEs. They're called liars. Um, <laughs> But what we've found is that the more simulation we do in our de department, the more normalised that behaviour becomes. So people get used to being observed and they start to lose some of that stress that we associate with being watched. I see this with our ANPs because I meet with them about once a week and we see patients together. When we first started seeing patients together, one of them could barely get a sentence out when I was in the room. But now he's able to take a history, perform an examination and then we can go through some further steps. So one of the things is that we need to do this regularly in order to get an accurate representation of what's happening in, happening in our departments. And the key to all of this is collaborating with our trainees and working alongside them. So what I would suggest is that in order to get your workplace-based assessments done in a meaningful way, you need to work alongside your trainees, and it's up to, up to you how you do that, whether you allocate yourself to a trainee for an entire shift, for a couple of hours, for a single patient, or whether you timetable time together, open your diary, allow you, your trainees to book in time with you and your secretary, and make opportunities for this to happen. I know it sounds time-consuming, but I'll explain to you later how it's going to save you time. You need to be engaged in these patient encounters as well. Don't leave the trainee to work on their own, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So let's break this down specifically into the kind of workplace-based assessments that they see. And my favourite is the mini kex. So this is what I use with the AMPs once a week. We go and see a patient together. This is an ideal opportunity for you to model communication skills and clinical judgment and team working and all those kind of things. And what I do with the AMPs is I stand in the room and I introduce myself to the patient as somebody who's there to observe. I get them to take the history and I'm listening, so I'm collecting all the same information, which means I don't have to listen to them tell me the history again, which is seriously the biggest pain in the bum of everything to do with workplace-based assessments. So that bit's immediately removed, and then I can watch them do the examination, and I will refuse to engage in a conversation about what to do next until they've committed themselves to writing down what they've found, forming a clinical impression and a plan. It doesn't matter if it's wrong, this is where we start the learning. And then we go and we discuss that and we probe it and we explore it together. These are the best ways to de develop clinical decision making, trust me. You've got opportunities to probe the thinking processes that they're undergoing and how they're coming to the conclusions that they're coming to. The consultation is safe because you're there and you're going to have all the same information as they've got, so you're not going to be worried that they're missing some big diagnosis. If they've never heard of a PE, how have they come to be so far in medicine? But you know, you're going to be there and you're going to be employing your senior review technique so you know <coughs> that, the, the, that the situation is safe. And this is the best way to ensure that what happens in your department is safe. And ACATs are kind of similar in that respect, but uh, over a longer period of time. So one of the best examples um, as a trainee <coughs> that I had for a KEX was I ran a resus scenario with the clinical director uh, for a real patient doing the airway and one of our presses of emergency medicine doing the echo guided life support, and I was a team leader. And that's a fantastic opportunity as a trainee to have senior people involved and doing the things that you could do, but you're learning to develop a particular skill. And both minikexes and ACATs can allow you to do that with senior trainees. You can identify areas that you want specifically to look at, particularly if you've got engaged trainees. Where do they want feedback? What do they want to develop in this particular scenario? The way I use ACATs typically with the F2s is when it's busy in recess, take the F2 in, get them to see the patients, and you can do the stuff that's got, that needs a doctor but has a low cognitive load. So you can do the cannula, the blood cultures, you can order the x-ray, you can do the prescribing. For us, that's stuff we barely have to think about. But it means that they can do the higher cognitive stuff. You can watch them doing their ABC assessment. You can model that shared, shared mental modelling. So teach them how to share their plan with the nurse who's there looking after the patient, explain what's going to happen, and with the patient themselves. And then you can talk about clinical judgments as well. 
Uh, one of our trainees, Ben, and I saw a, short, a pa patient with shortness of breath who'd come in as a standby call. So I did the cannula and the blood cultures. He took the history and examined the patient. I prescribed the antibiotics and the fluids uh, and requested the x-ray. He contacted the GP, got the letter. The patient was referred to the medical team. Perfect care, sepsis 6 was delivered in 40 minutes. The patient had a consultant level review. That's excellent care, and that's probably about half the time it would have taken if one of us had been doing it on our own. And plus, he gets to make all the clinical decisions with senior support, and we can discuss his decision making. Case-based discussions are slightly different, on a, and I think they're a real challenge for us in the emergency department because they're the driest of all, because you haven't got a patient there, so it's difficult to learn. So the way that these have worked well for us is to use them after a night shift. Get your night shift doctors, particularly the ones who are doing nights on their own for the first time as the senior doctor in the department, to flag up and keep a record of the patients that are interesting overnight and get them to bring the notes to you after their night shift uh, and to do a case-based discussion. And it doesn't have to be one patient, it can be a theme. So in our paediatric ED, it's usually a couple of patients with shortness of breath, a bronchiolitic baby and a child with asthma. And you can discuss the nuances of the differences in care. Why do you do this for that patient and this for that patient? And go through those, uh, those decisions. How did you decide that that was the, what you were going to do? Did that plan work? How did you decide it had worked? Did anything change your mind? What was it and why did you make that decision? And then you're able to bring in evidence-based medicine and journal articles and some of these phone resources to expand the learning further. And I think some of you have been to the workshop already on DOPS, so I'm not going to talk more about that, other than to say some of this stuff we can do through simulation, and we should be open to that. And we also need to encourage our trainees to think about DOPS as being formative, not summative. There's too much focus, I think, on summative evaluation. It doesn't need to be that way. None of us is perfect in the first instance. We've all got places to learn, and we can show progressive improvement as long as we're open to spending time to do this kind of stuff. And then we come to listening, which is really important, not just from the feedback side of things, but allowing that trainee the time and the space to articulate what they've been thinking. So when they've done their clinical assessment and they've written up their plan and their clinical impression, we go somewhere different. And I usually allow them about five to 10 minutes to make a cup of tea and bring it to the office because that extra processing time is really important to help them to articulate the, all those non-verbal things we heard about in Simon's talk, all those clinical judgment things allow that, that knowledge time to settle and for them to develop it and recognise that it's there. And then you can go into your feedback phase, which, as we've just heard, is really important as well. And I would say that this needs to be done pretty soon after your clinical evaluations. And you need to do it with filling that form with the, the doctor or the trainee in front of you. Don't allow them to email it to you. You need to be doing feedback face to face. They need to know that it's feedback. And you can say, get a cup of tea, come and sit in the office and we'll give, I'll give you some feedback and we'll talk about the things that you've done together. You can use inquiry as part of your feedback technique. So uh, as Catherine was talking about, that use of language is really important. But you can pick out things like, I noticed that you saw the patient had low blood pressure. What were you thinking about when you identified that? Where were you going? What did you decide to do? What did you think might be causing it? Is there anything else that might have been going on? Just like, take these opportunities to explore. And then give the trainees an opportunity to learn from what they've been doing. So this is where I bring in all these kind of foam resources. And one of the best examples of that is that the ACCS trainees have to see an anaphylaxis patient. We have to do a workplace-based assessment on it. And we always end up talking about biphasic reactions. They're obsessed with biphasic reactions. Everyone has to come in because they're going to have a biphasic reaction. Well, are they? And there's a fantastic uh, podcast by Ken Milner, The Skeptic's Guide to Emergency Medicine, exactly about biphasic, podcast, uh, biphasic reactions. And I say, do you, have you listened to this podcast? Well, let's make that a learning objective. Go and listen to this podcast. And then we'll meet and we'll discuss it and we'll talk about how that's shaped your clinical care in the future, if it has. So that's the next thing to say. Create a follow-up appointment. We need to think of assessments not as single points in time, but as a continuous process. So if you've met and given feedback to a trainee and you've advised them to do something differently, then you also need to meet with them again and see how that information sunk in, whether they've used it, whether they've developed it, whether they have learned anything. And then this is a great opportunity to encourage them to perform literature reviews, to write letters to journals, to comment on blog posts, to develop a three-part question and do a best bet. Encourage them to become learners in a wider envir environment than just your department. So they're not just learning on their own, they're learning within your department and then in the wider world of emergency medicine. Sometimes I start ranting about Twitter in these situations, but I try really hard not to. And what does this mean for our trainees? 
it means that they see that we're interested. We're interested in them developing. We're interested in the, the fact that they have these assessments that they have to do, that they feel attention about, because they have to do them in order to progress. But they also start to see the passion and the nuance and the, the fantastic nitty-gritty that is emergency medicine, all that clinical decision-making that we enjoy and the challenge. We need to know what our trainees are doing. We need to keep our departments safe. We need to help our trainees to develop. So my challenge to you is to put aside time for this and make time in your clinical day. For me, it works best in my SPA time when I try to, I meet with, that's when I meet with the AMPs. But if people ask me that they want to do workplace-based assessments, I say, yes, my next non-clinical day is this day. I will come with you on the shop floor because it means I can say to the nursing staff, no, I can't come and see that other patient in recess because I'm actually not clinical today and I'm devoting my time to this. That may or may not work for you. And a, a, a bit of a mixture is probably a good idea. But whatever you do, it's important that you make this a habit because your learners will pick up on it and they will start to expect more of their workplace-based assessments. And they won't accept the just email me a form and I'll fill it in because that becomes meaningless. So this is a really good opportunity to help people to aspire to excellence, which we've talked about already this morning, and to be the best doctors that they can be, whether they decide to stay in emergency medicine, which they really should, or not. And as Matthew says, not only do they matter and give us insight, and speak volumes, but anything less than the best that we give our trainees is a felony. <laughs> so I shall leave you with him, articulating himself in the way that only he can. And I hope that you'll approach that he's a workplace based assessment slightly differently <coughs> in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>